Well, our first guest tonight said this about her uncle. He is quite simply a loser. Mary Trump knows more about Donald Trump than any of us ever will. And Mary Trump is sure that what you are about to hear Letitia James, the Attorney General Letitia James, say after winning a half billion dollar civil fraud judgment against Donald Trump will push him closer to the edge. If he does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment, uh, then we will seek uh, you know, judgment enforcement mechanisms in court and we will ask the judge to seize his assets. We are prepared to make sure that the judgment is paid to New Yorkers. And yes, I look at 40 Wall Street each and every day. Mary Trump writes, knowing Donald as I do, here's why I know this statement will push him closer to the edge. First, James implies that there's a possibility Donald does not have enough cash to satisfy the judgment. That alone is enough to enrage him. James took it a step further. We are prepared to make sure that the judgment is paid to New Yorkers. And yes, I look at 40 Wall Street each and every day, James said, referring to the Trump building in Manhattan. 40 Wall Street is the building that Donald Trump proudly proclaimed on 9-11, suddenly became the tallest building in lower Manhattan immediately after the World Trade Center Towers collapsed after a terrorist attack. I mean, 40 Wall Street actually was the second tallest building in downtown Manhattan. And, and it was actually before the World Trade Center was the tallest. And then when they built the World Trade Center, it became known as the second tallest. And now it's the tallest. That's what was actually happening. What was on the screen was what was actually happening while Donald Trump was saying that. The World Trade Center was burning. It was on its way to collapse. And all Donald Trump cared about when he was far away from that danger zone, the only thing that he could think about was the size of his building in lower Manhattan. He wasn't even slightly worried that he might have lost a friend in the rubble at the World Trade Center. In fact, he didn't know anyone who died that day and never went to a single 9-11 funeral, although years later he lied about that and said that he, quote, lost hundreds of friends on 9-11, end quote. That was a complete lie. He lost no friends on 9-11. But he now could lose 40 Wall Street. If that is what it takes to pay the judgment against him, Donald Trump's cognitive decline continues in plain view. We're going to take over Washington, D.C. We're going to federalize. We're going to have very powerful crime. And you're going to be proud of it again. We're going to have very powerful crime. And you're going to be proud of it. Now imagine how many headlines there would be about that story if Joe Biden had said those exact words. Donald Trump gets to say, we're going to have very powerful crime and you're going to be proud of it. And no one in the news media even notices. In Donald Trump's declining mind, he probably thought he was saying something, but the words that came out were idiotic. And that happens all the time. They come out with uh, faucets where no water comes out. You know, if you go and buy a home and they know what I mean, the showers, you stand under a shower and then said that. And think about what Donald Trump just said. Donald Trump thinks that if a shower produces no water, you actually have to stand there five times longer. Think about that. Think about how that mind works. How long would you stay in your shower if no water was coming out? Wouldn't you get out of there a lot faster if no water is coming out? If someone told you that no water was coming out of their shower, would you then assume that they stay in the shower five times longer? That's how Donald Trump's mind works in cognitive decline. Donald Trump said and apparently believes because of his cognitive decline, quote, they come out with faucets where no water comes out. 
We will get Mary Trump's assessment of Donald Trump's cognitive decline in a moment. But for those of you who might not have heard Donald Trump speak 25 years ago, when he was 52 years old, I found an amazing example of how Donald Trump spoke then in the brilliant Rick Burns, brother of Ken Burns, documentary series about New York City produced in 1999. Imagine my amazement watching an episode of that documentary which tells the story of New York City from the arrival of the Dutch to the present day using the insights of brilliant historians and New Yorkers and New York legends like Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was an authoritative historian of New York in his own right. A series of distinguished, wise voices. And then to suddenly hear a voice begin off screen and sound strangely familiar, but it couldn't be that voice, could it? The reason the great skyscrapers went up in Manhattan is that Manhattan is an island of very powerful bedrock. It's granite and basically very, very high density rock that frankly digging foundations is unbelievably difficult. You have to blast to build in Manhattan. And the buildings went up in Manhattan because of the power of that bedrock. Once you dig that foundation, and when they dig, they really dig. They, they dig with dynamite. And once you dynamite out and you secure that foundation, that building isn't going anywhere. Every word of that is true. Who is that guy? That is not the same mind you're listening to today. Donald Trump went from saying that accurate and informative statement about building in New York City 25 years ago to now saying they come out with faucets where no water comes out. The showers, you stand under a shower and there is no water coming out. And you say you end up standing there five times longer. What happened to that mind? over the last 25 years and what is happening to that mind tonight as Attorney General of New York Letitia James closes in on Donald Trump's assets. You know, I immediately thought of you uh, Sunday night uh, sitting there enthralled by this documentary series about New York City. And, I, and it was just like I said, I heard, I heard that voice, the camera's not on him, and I heard a little bit more, and then there he was. And I, and I was just stunned. It, it's completely clear. Those are sentences. It's a paragraph. Everything's true. It's a serious point about how you actually build on this island and why you're able to build so high on this island. And then I'm hearing him talk about people are buying faucets that water doesn't come out of. What happened? What happened from the guy I, who said that and was able to say that in 1999 about construction and now doesn't know how faucets work? Well, Lawrence, I think a couple of things are going on. And, and one is perhaps the, the most obvious. This is a person who has untreated uh, psychiatric disorders uh, and any untreated disorder of any kind worsens over time um, as long as it remains untreated. Uh, so it, it makes perfect sense that somebody who is unhealthy as he is, who is under the extraordinary amount of stress he's under, would have a harder time holding it together cognitively. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting um, before I get to the second point, is that Donald was always quite good uh, when he was younger at sticking to a point, and mm -hmm. uh, you know he he knew certain things about uh, his business, uh, so he could say perfectly reasonable statements like that with confidence. And let's let's be fair; he's very he was very good uh, at being in the media, and that's one of the main reasons my grandfather chose him to be his successor, uh, because he had that kind of presence. 
Um, so the second point, though, that it struck me in, in watching that is that his target audience is cha has changed dramatically in the ensuing decades. He used to be focused on becoming a part of New York City's upper crust inner circle. He desperately wanted to be part of that milieu. He desperately wanted to be accepted by his betters, which is how he perceived them. And now he appeals to an audience that appreciates the kind of anecdotes about showers that don't produce water and that uh, is full of the kind of invective and hatred that he has now become expert at. So I think those two things kind of track together. I, I was struck by what you've written about um, where he is in relation to the edge as a result of uh, New York State Attorney General Letitia James closing in on him. And that specific line she said in that television interview about she looks at 40 Wall Street every day. Uh, is it your sense that Attorney General James has figured out two things, how to beat Donald Trump in court and how to drive him absolutely insane with statements like that? Yeah, she has his number uh, for sure. And anybody who's from New York who has been paying any attention for the last many decades knows what makes him tick. And what's so fascinating about this latest chapter in his life is that he's finally reached the end of the road. Um, when he was taking over for my grandfather or when he was my grandfather's successor and the one who was going to fill my grandfather's ambitions, he had he didn't need skill. He just need skill as a real estate developer. He just needed the skill as the arrogant, self-confident, brash guy who played well on television. Um, my grandfather always had hundreds of millions of dollars to prop him up. Um, we know that when after my grandfather died, Donald sold the empire lock, stock and barrel at a loss of approximately $300 million. So he still had some cash on hand to keep it going and that he kept getting rehabilitated and rehabilitated. A.G. James knows better than anybody else that there's nobody else left to hand Donald a blank check anymore. And that's what keeps him up at night because he is terrified of having the truth about him be known, not just to other people, but to himself, because that's what's kept him going all these times, all, all these years. The lie that has become in his own mind, the truth about what a great, successful man he is. So he his uh, criminal trial in Manhattan uh, starts uh, Monday, March 25th with jury selection. Uh, you get I get the sense from him from my distance that he is more disturbed at civil judgments that force him to pay money uh, than he is at being criminally indicted where there isn't necessarily any sort of fine involved. You're absolutely right. And there are two reasons for this. The, the most obvious one is that money in my family was always the only currency. It stood in for everything else. The more you have, the more you, you're worth. As long as you have more than other people, you're worth more in every sense of what that word means. And the other thing that's really important uh, to keep in mind is that he no longer cares about the criminal trials because one, they won't necessarily cost him money, but two, they increase his street cred with his base and with the Republican Party, which is a very devastating commentary on where we are as a country. Uh, so as you go forward uh, this year, uh, w when we're looking at what is bringing him to the edge, we should keep our minds, our eyes more on the civil cases and how is he coming up with the money and how is he getting through that than what's going to happen to him in the criminal trials? Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case, Lawrence. Mary Trump, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Always glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've been eager to talk to you this week uh, after the tragedy of uh, Alexei Navalny's murder last week. And I, I just want to begin with your reflections on Alexei Navalny, what he has meant to Russia 
and what his martyrdom will mean to Russia? Well, the, the most important thing to say about, about Alexei Navalny, I think, is that he was a courageous person in a, in a time when I worry that fear is rising in our politics and where fear is so important to the collapse of democracy around the world, he was courageous. He was courageous enough to tell the Russian people that they were being ruled by crooks and thieves. He was courageous enough to return to Russia after he'd been poisoned, knowing that he would be imprisoned. He was courageous enough to tell the truth about oligarchy, which is something we could all use. I think his, his death um, not only deprives Russia of a hope for a different future, it's an example of how Putin has tried to crush the generation younger than him and the generations younger than that. It's a sign of how a kind of authoritarian gerontocracy is removing the future from Russia. Is there something uh, in the Russian people that uh, that somehow supports this kind of heroism? Because it's it's so difficult for me to think of a contemporary American counterpart. We have Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, decades ago, but a contemporary American counterpart to Alexei Navalny is is, is hard to imagine. And I, I think of uh, Nadia Tolokonikova and others who spent years uh, in Russian prisons and still are in this fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can't help but think, of course, also of the, the numerous Ukrainian citizens, not just prisoners of war, but simply Ukrainian citizens who've been kidnapped and are held in Russian prisons, and the numerous Ukrainian intellectuals, writers, um, people of culture, people, all, people of all walks of life who are courageously fighting against Russia and risking their lives right now. Many other people have been killed by Putin, sadly, since Navalny was killed. I think that Russians, uh, that there is a proud Russian liberal tradition of risking one's life for the truth. And I think the people who do it know that the truth, uh, the truth is, is in a way the very last resort. It's the last thing that you have. And I think that that is why you will see, uh, along with Navalny, among the list of people who have been killed by Putin, so many journalists. Uh, what does the what are the stakes as you see them tonight in a presidential election uh, between Donald Trump and Joe Biden on the issues we're talking about here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, N Navalny, Nav one of Navalny's most important things that he said was, don't be afraid. And that really is the fulcrum. If, if you're the Republican Party and you're afraid of Trump, you've already given up on democracy. If you're the Democrats and, and you're afraid instead of trying to win, then you've got to bet, then your chances are lower in, in November. Um, if you're Trump, what you've already said is that you want to lock up your opponents just like Putin locks up his opponents. So it's we could go in that direction if we elect the wrong person. Um, things can go very quickly the wrong way. We could look much more like that country. We could look much more like a country where there, where there's a widow and a daughter who are grieving. We could look much more like that country where a mother can't even get access to the body of her son. And it can happen very quickly. There are unfortunately politicians in our country who like that model. So I'd say that pretty much everything is at stake.